I know every parent thinks about this. So what do you want your child's future to look like? At Stowell Learning Centers, we talk about how what we do changes a student's future. One of the good things about getting older and having been in business such a long time is that I have actually gotten to see many of those futures. It has been so gratifying to see our kids who previously struggled with dyslexia, auditory processing, or learning disabilities, kids whose parents were, you know, afraid they weren't gonna pass fourth grade, go on to college and graduate school. I heard a sobering statistic last Friday regarding unemployment numbers during this COVID-19 crisis the unemployment rate for those without a high school diploma was 22% as compared to 8.4% for those with a college degree. There are a lot of questions around finding and getting into a college that is a good fit, especially now with COVID-19 and especially if your teen struggles with learning or attention. We are going to address a lot of those questions for you today. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We are live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, author and founder of Stowell Learning Centers, where we help children and adults permanently change their learning and attention challenges, including dyslexia. I want to welcome Lauren Ma, the director of our Irvine Center. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning. Hi, everyone. I will be moderating and comments. So if you're here and you're joining us on either Facebook Live or YouTube, be sure to say hi so we know who's here. I'd love to see um, comments and just saying hi to to people I know, so so drop us a line, say hi. And um, can you believe it? We've had 17,000, over 17,000 viewers uh, so far to our previous episode, so that's exciting. Um, and if you have questions throughout the broadcast, be sure to type them in the chat and I'll be reading those um, and we'll be answering your questions, okay? Thanks. Perfect. Well, if you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Our guest today is Janice Royal, founder and president of Royal College Consulting based in Costa Mesa, California. Janice retired from the corporate world when her youngest daughter was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome and committed herself to learning everything she could about parenting, educating, and encouraging children who have learning differences. This journey led Janice to the area of college counseling as she discovered that college planning resources were scarce for families challenged with learning disabilities, ADHD, dyslexia, and autism spectrum disorder. Janice is a certified college counselor and takes a very personal approach to helping students and families navigate the college planning process and find a school that is just the right fit. So welcome, Janice. Thank you, Jill. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning and congratulations. I hear one daughter is graduating from college and your youngest is heading off to college with a full scholarship. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. We actually attended a virtual graduation for my college daughter on Friday. Uh, she too went to college on a full tuition scholarship. So uh, nice. there are processes that uh, help us get there. <laughs> well, we are anxious to hear about those. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, and, you know, you have so many important points to share with our families today. So Let's start off with some of the differences between high school and college that families need to be aware of. Perfect, that's a great place to start. So I'd like to begin 
discussing the differences between high school and college for students with learning disabilities by sharing with you the federal laws that govern each of those times in a student's life. So K through 12 is governed by the Individuals with Disabilities Act that was uh, enacted by our federal government in 1973. And what we call it I, um, IDEA for short, everything's an acronym in college planning. And the focus of IDEA is on a student's academic success. And the law stipulates that education is a right. So that is the law that your student, that your child, uh, your student will be under that umbrella until they graduate high school. After high school, after they turn 18, then they come under the purview of the American Disabilities Act. And the American Disabilities Act, specifically um, that was updated and uh, enacted in 1990, updated in 1990, talks about the, the focus shifts because now it says, this law says that education is an opportunity from this point forward. And the focus is on access to curriculum. So there's a tremendous delineation between high school and college, not only how the law sees it for students with learning differences, um, but also how then a student needs to prepare themselves to work with this new set of circumstances, this new set of uh, criteria that, that, you know, that sets the framework for how a college will meet them along their education journey. And so in high school, your student will have a, an IEP or a 504 that is the roadmap for teachers and the student and the parent who's also highly involved uh, in the process to that provide a, a framework for which the student can receive accommodations, perhaps um, some differences in some reduction in the criteria that they might have to meet in order to graduate, so on and so forth. Um, that is not the same in college. Some universities will accept the IEP or 504 as part of the documentation that's required for um, to receive college, uh, to receive, pardon me, uh, accommodations in college. Typically, however, the College Disability Services Office, that is the pathway through which students will receive accommodations in college, they require formal neuropsychological evaluations. And those, those neuropsych evaluations do need to be conducted by a professional who has the expertise to make a diagnosis and give recommendations for accommodations for um, whatever the learning disability is that the student has. While a student is under the purview of a school district, so again, um, K through 12, the school district must provide the, the testing of a student um, at no cost to the family. And that testing, that psychological educational testing allows the family to have a formal report that details um, what kind of accommodations may support, you know, would support the student best to learn. Well, in college, that report becomes key to opening access to accommodations to help the student once they're in college. So if, a, if that psych ed which we just call that for short because it's kind of a long name. If that psych ed testing has, is older than three years old by the time a student is ready to begin college, then it should be updated so that it is within a three-year time frame 
at the time that a student will enroll in college. I like to recommend to my clients that, that their child be tested, uh, retested when they turn 16, because that's when the adult scale of IQ tests can be um, can be performed um, on on the you know with the student, and so that is really critical and and necessary for the documentation that again the disability services office at college will require. If a family does not have updated testing, has never had this testing done, then when they do when the student does try to um, reach out to the disability services office and acquire accommodations, the cost is completely borne by the student. It's the student or the family's responsibility to have uh, to pay for that testing to be done. And that testing can be significant, um, several thousand dollars. So it's good to get it updated while the student is still in high school. Um, also, with respect to high school difference, the um, accommodations are the responsibility of the school while a, a child is in high school. Once they're out of high school and moving into the college arena, securing accommodations is completely up to the student. And that is such a key factor. And that is why I encourage my clients, my, my students, to begin engaging in their IEP or their 504 meetings as soon as possible in high school, because they are then going to become their own advocate on their college campus. And in order to be a good advocate for themselves, they need to be able to speak and share what their diagnosis is. They need to be able to clearly um, share what the accommodations are that they have used in the past and what they'd like to use going forward and how those accommodations have helped them. So it's really important, I believe, for a student to engage early in high school with that those meetings so that they have the words, they have the language, they have the confidence to be able to then self-advocate um, on the college campus. And then as far as any um, parental role, that's another big difference with respect to high school versus college. So in high school, parents are very much engaged in the IEP meetings and the 504 meetings and you know, all of the students' educational progress. Um, some parents, if you were, if you're anything like me, um, I was uh, very much a helicopter parent, and I it took me a lot of years. Fortunately for my second child, the one with Asperger's, I landed the helicopter pretty early in high school, so I wasn't looking at her grades every day, every week. I settled down. Unfortunately, my oldest one <laughs> definitely received um, a lot of scrutiny, but with respect to my access and to a parent's access, K through 12, you have total access to a student's educational records. That stops once a student leaves high school and, well, and then moves into college. And the reason it stops is because we have something called the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. We call it FERPA for short, and or that's the acronym, acronym FERPA. And what FERPA says is that parents have no right um, to the student's educational records. Those are private records. The student has to grant the parents access or a third party access. So there is a waiver that universities have. And I strongly recommend to my clients that are now going to be soon going to be going through orientation and registering for uh, classes for the fall. I recommend that they do get that form from the university, review it with their parents, and that the students sign it and return it to the university. Because it's very important, I feel, for at least the first semester or two, maybe longer, 
for the parents to um, come alongside their student who's now moving into young adulthood. College is new and different for everybody. It can be particularly overwhelming for students with learning differences. It depends on the student, depends on what the learning difference is, but it's good to have this document on file in case the parent um, does need to engage a little bit more than, than um, perhaps you know, a student without a learning difference as parent might. The, on a side note, what also goes away is the access to medical records. So I also recommend that students sign a HIPAA waiver, and that allows parents to have access to their medical records. This becomes very important if a student is on any kind of medication or is being seen by a medical or a professional or a psychologist. So Jill, did you have a question? Wow, that is just, all of this is so, such valuable information for parents. All that information about the IEPs and then just understanding that parents don't automatically have access when their kids go to college. And I know it's so hard for parents to let go, especially if you have a child with special needs and you've really had to intervene and navigate the system and closely monitor their education. So just understanding these differences between high school and college and the waivers, that's, that's huge. And it can be a little shocking, I believe, to most parents. They yeah. don't realize that and the importance of taking care of that early on in the process. Yeah. And the importance of kids, of you know, our teenagers starting to get involved in their own education and IEP meetings and having the language. That's that's huge also because they are going to be expected to advocate for themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the parents are not invited into the disability services office um, <laughs> or into classrooms or to contact professors or to, as a matter of fact, I do spend a lot of time with my students teaching them how to send emails to their admissions rep to uh, perhaps a prospective professor those are important skills that yeah. that a young person needs when they uh, before they arrive on campus. Absolutely. Well, let's check in with Lauren and see what comments and questions we have from the audience. Hi, this is this is great. We have a few people saying hello, so I want to just shout out Catherine. Thank you. Hello, and we have Allison here. I know Allison. Uh, she's a parent. Uh, for Irvine Center. So hi, Allison, and welcome. Joe, and I think maybe Anne, maybe they share a profile. They say hi. Rob, hmm, this person sounds familiar. Janet, or do you know, do you know this person? <laughs> hi. <Sure. laughs> uh, and Jane, we know Jane. Hi, with our Irvine Center. Um, I do, we do have a, um, Catherine has kind of a, a comment or um, a misconception. I can answer this. And Janice, I'm sure you know as well, but she's saying that the, the psycho evaluation report is not free for private schools. Um, but no, I mean, right. Isn't it true that all parents have um, access to their local school district. So wherever their home school district is, that is the district responsible for doing testing. The parent, if the child is enrolled in a private school, just has to go to the district and request that testing. Am I correct? You are correct. And that is absolutely true. Know your rights and make sure that you, um, if you do attend, if your student does attend a private high school, that does not take away your student's right to that testing. And that's critical because testing, as I said, can be multiple thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and right, so if, <laughs> if a family would like to take advantage of that, they certainly can. They should reach out starting with the local um, school and then, um, or the district, and then finding out what the process is. Right now I have students it is done in person or traditionally has been done in person. So I have uh, a couple of my students are waiting until the school year resumes and then we'll get that testing done. 
Um, but right now, a little bit on hold, luckily. Right. They're, cur they're currently sophomore sophomores, so we do have some time mm -hmm. for them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a whole new world, and I don't expect you to know that answer right now of how school psychologists and how schools are going to do testing remotely, <laughs> but um, they got to figure it out. So um, just wanted to clear up that misconception that even if your child does attend a private school, you still have the right or the access through the local school district. You just have to take the initiative as a parent yes. to go to the school district. And what, what exactly is that process? Is that in writing? Is that showing up in person to the district? I would say that varies by district. Um, the first step is to make a phone call and just share that where your student goes to school, what what their home high school should be and the person at the district will explain to the parent what the process is. Okay. Yeah, that will Absolutely. definitely vary by district. Right, absolutely. And that's what we have for that. I do like the suggestion of, um, and this is something we work on with our students, is that self-advocating yes. um, process because it takes a while. It takes a while for our kids, especially with learning and attention challenges, to develop that executive function skill of speaking up and being responsible for something that previously maybe their parents handled so starting that process early in high school um, and, and having them attend their their own sst meetings their own IEP meetings um, i think is a great suggestion um, to help that transition go a little smoother so that's Definitely. great yeah. want to make sure let's see and robin says hi and i know robin um, also from Orange County area. Look at that. It's a reunion. These are all the adults that are <laughs> adult contact. Nice. <laughs> well, Janice has provided some really good handouts for parents. So I want to make sure you know about that. To get those, go to stowellcenter.com slash college. And we will put that in the chat also so that you can get that link. So Janice, you were telling me um, that because of COVID-19, colleges are actually more accessible virtually than they ever were before. So yes. if it's you know, been hard to get on a plane and go visit different colleges, well, now people can, can visit them virtually. So what guidance do you have for families in relation to finding a college? Well, you are absolutely correct. There is brand new content up by, I would say, the vast majority of universities. And I'll get to that in just a minute about how students should take advantage of that. Finding The process, however, for finding a college is the same for students with learning differences as it is for students, uh, neurotypical students, with some additional steps. And that is why I, again, encourage families to begin the process as early as sophomore year, because there's a lot of steps that should be taken in order to eventually make the best decision for where the student will ultimately be going to college. And the process of determining, uh, finding the right fit college is, um, I always like to ask my student, what is it that you want to get out of college? So yes, moving away from home perhaps is a big one, you know, doing a uh, going to football games, all of that college spirit is great. Majoring in, uh, you know, becoming a nurse or becoming um, a business professional, um, interior designer, whatever the case might be as far as their major. But it's important for the student to be able to answer that question. What is it that they want out of college so that they can then begin the process of identifying colleges that will provide that fit. So typically what I do uh, after I begin that conversation with my students is I will and I encourage all students to take a personality test and those are free. Um, most high schools and at least in California will, will um, give a personality test. You get your Myers-Briggs code, you know if you're a 
you know, if you're an ENFJ or whatever it is that you might be. And what's nice about those personality tests, as well as the Holland Interest Inventory Test, is that that helps us understand the, the vocations where a student might ultimately thrive. And again, the process is the same for all students. You, if a student thinks that they want to be an engineer, but by all indications, uh, they do have no interest or they're, they're not great at collaboration, perhaps they don't like uh, they're not very strong in detail, um, you know, certain criteria that are necessary to be an engineer. If that's not a student's forte, then we want to look at other areas. Maybe computer science would be better suited for that particular student. So those, those assessments, I think, are very important to be done. Then there's a process of an inventory kind of a, an interview of the student that I will take um, my clients through. And it's answering basic questions as to what type of college they are looking for. Do they want a faith-based or a secular university or do they perhaps not care? What size of school are they looking for? Do they want very small or do they want extremely large? There is often a correlation with the size of a university um, with respect to providing very strong support for a student with learning differences. That isn't always the case. Sometimes it can be a better fit for a student if they experience anxiety when they're with you know, a very busy uh, place, there's a lot of people, too much happening, that kind of thing, or they need to get to know their professors real closely. Maybe a small to mid-sized university is better for that student. Um, there are numerous um, programs that support students with learning differences on very large universities. The University of Arizona is one of our very um, well-known and local favorites, relatively local. They have a, the SALT program that works with students on all levels, um, all different types of learning differences. Cal State Long Beach is another, Cal State um, Northridge is also another local universities that have very, very large universities that have excellent support programs for students with learning disabilities. Okay, but so beyond the size of the school, what, where do they want? What location? What, what's the geography that they're looking for? Hot, cold, north, south, east, west, all those kinds of things are important to know. The major, if they know it. Not every university, for example, offers a major in interior design. Not all universities offer, believe it or not, computer science. Hard to believe nowadays, but it's true. <laughs> and so that's important. Does the student have special interests? Do they want to participate in the music programs, um, sororities, fraternities, um, any kind of you know mission uh, trips, those sorts of things? So all of those become part of the conversation for students as they're looking at the over three thousand universities, four-year universities that we have in this country. Financial considerations are a big part of that discussion as well, and then very, very important is what are the accommodations that the that the disability services office allows, provides and supports for the student. Um, this needs to be part of, as you said, Jill, any kind of tours that the student goes on with their family. Now, right now, virtual tours are very robust. A student can go to for example, Oregon State University, you can go to their website, you can not only um, take a virtual tour of the campus, you can take a live virtual tour with a student. I'm not sure if they're walking around with their iPhone or they've got a GoPro on their head. I'm not sure how that's going down, but a student can literally join a current OSU student and be toured around the campus. They can also sit in on, a, on particular majors presentations. So hear from the professors um, that teach in that major what the major is all about. They can go to admission, live admission sessions. They can do live live chat 
and Q&A. So some universities have comp really embraced this um, COVID-19 and put up amazing content. Um, what I have not seen is, are any kinds of live communications with the Disability Services Office, but certainly the people that work there are available via email and maybe chat, but certainly by email and by phone. Um, if that you know gets arranged, can meetings can be arranged that way. Um, and and always, always a, a student should be looking at what the disability services provides um, at that particular university. Ideally, once the nation opens back up and tours begin in person again, if it works out for a family's timing and budget and all of that, then a face-to-face on-the-ground on the tour is always excellent because you definitely get a particular vibe about the university, but always include time to go visit the Disability Services Office. One of the handouts that I've provided is a pretty lengthy, but a very important um, interview packet that those are the critical questions that any family, any student would want to ask a disability services office. Um, and the more welcoming that as office is to answering those questions, the more I would, I think the student can move that university into the, this is a place where I would thrive category. Um, if you're hit by, you know, kind of a block wall and people don't want to spend the time or take the time to answer your questions, um, if there's a lot of pushback or just not a very welcoming feeling, take that as a uh, indication that, that might not be a place where you're going to get the support that you need, where this, what the student needs. Okay, so that is how you would start to begin to develop the college list. I also wanted to share a really great resource called the K&W Guide to students, um, pardon me, to colleges for students with learning differences. This particular guide is about, oh, a good two and a half inches thick. It, it's reminiscent of a SAT prep book. And what's inside is a treasure trove of information about hundreds and hundreds of universities across and colleges across the nation, not only describing the, the um, institution itself and their admission detail, but also spending a great deal of time describing the disability services that are available at that university. Again, critical information to know. You could almost use this guide um, to pre-fill in that interview document that is part of your resources um, upon the conclusion of this particular session. And what I like particularly about the KW guide is it details if a college's support is on a basic level, if it's more um, more constructed, or if it is a um, more coordinated rather, or if it's a very structured program. And those differences are significant because the basic level is going to just be meeting the letter of the law. Um, that's a lot of universities. That might be okay for your student. If your student needs minimal, if your child needs minimal support, uh, maybe they just need additional time on a test. Uh, maybe they need to take their test in a quiet area. Um, some of some accommodations are universal enough that they're, you know, easier to receive and easier for the college to provide and um, give the student access to. So, so basic might be okay. But then there are important differences between um, coordinated services where you have actual certified learning disability professionals. So people that are trained in how to work with and you know, establish education um, parameters and guidelines for students. And this is uh, also good for students who perhaps uh, need minimal, uh, pardon me, 
minimal um, accommodations. They they don't need um, a tremendous amount of assistance with their executive function, for example, deficits or things like that. Then structured programs becomes a whole new category. There are far fewer universities that have structured programs, but if your student has significant executive function deficits, if they need uh, perhaps a mentor or they need academic skills training, um, perhaps they need someone, a professional, <laughs> take this with a grain of salt, but a professional parent um, to, to, that they can check it in with every week to make sure that they're meeting their assignments, that they're staying on track, that they're putting the time in that they need in order to study. Um, a lot, I would say the majority of students that go to college don't realize that for every hour you spend in the classroom, you need to dedicate three hours outside of the classroom to do the homework, uh, review your notes, rewrite your notes, do the reading, uh, prepare for you know the coming uh, the coming class, do any kind of projects, work on projects that might be due later on. So students with any kind of executive function deficits become very challenged when um, if that's the case. And so these structured programs, sometimes there's a an additional fee of a few thousand dollars charged for, um, each semester that a student utilizes these programs, but they can be instrumental in making sure that a student, again, um, gets off to a fantastic start at the university level. So those are all identified in that KNW guide um, and can be a tremendous help for, um, for parents. Uh, okay, so that is really what, um, I had to share about the developing the college list and, and how you would go about finding a particular college. You know, that was, that was incredibly helpful. So much meat in there. Thank you Good. so much. Good. You were talking, you know, I know right now, a lot of people are really concerned about what's going to happen with testing for college. Yeah. And you had mentioned to me something that I actually hadn't heard of, and that was test optional mm -hmm. um, college entrance. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I would be delighted to. I actually have a slide that would um, would be a good time to put this up because what what's important for students and parents to understand when you're applying to a university is that the there's a whole list. Most universities are going to do um, an admission review on a holistic basis, meaning they're looking at the entire student. They're looking at the student's entire application. And within that component are, if you kind of think of it as slices of a pie. There you go. So this is a, a visual that I created just to show you what that pie is comprised of. Now, with COVID-19, so many universities across the nation have said that they are going to go test optional because they did not want our current crop of juniors to grow so anxious and so despondent and so depressed over the fact that the entire spring testing season was canceled and they perhaps had not had a chance to to take a standardized test. So a lot of universities, including the University of California system and the Cal uh, California State University system, came out early and announced, we're gonna be test optional. Now, there have always been many hundreds of universities that are test optional. And a test optional has been around for quite some time. It's, it's a growing movement. Um, not everybody feels that these standardized tests are uh, equal in that or that they, they, they typically will um, definitely favor a student who comes from college-educated parents, uh, that kind of family. 
They favor students who come from a solidly middle class and higher socioeconomic background. And that's I, hopefully relatively self-explanatory. I can get into the details as to why that is if there's a question. But essentially, lots of universities have been looking at the ACT and SAT. Is this something we want to continue? And the answer currently is yes. And the reason it's yes is because it provides another slice of the pie for the admissions officer who is trying to decide, can this student succeed academically on our campus, on my campus? What information do I have from their file that will help me determine this? And this is one of the pieces of information. Now, the majority of information, the admissions staff is going to get from a student's coursework that they've taken ninth through 11th uh, and then that and that they are enrolled in for 12th grade and what grades did they earn in those classes those are the most important categories that a university is looking at but say those things are equal among a wide number of students and so what a, what a university admissions staff is also tasked with doing is not just will the student survive, survive, thrive on our campus academically, but will they thrive here socially? Can, are they a good fit for our community? Do they offer those things that we um, are in need of here on our campus? Maybe we need an alto sax player, which my daughter happens to play. And, um, and you know, and they are uh, someone who can come into and, and be part of the symphony, even though they're not, pardon me, even though they're not a music major. So, so an admissions officer has a really big job. And the testing gives them one more piece of information. Um, if a student is deciding not to take the test at all, if a, if a junior is currently in the process of saying, you know what, everybody's test optional, which is not true, there's many universities that are still going to require the test, um, you need to make sure that as the pie, that other half of the pie fills in and you're only left with three slices, are those three slices going to be strong enough to show the university the kind of candidate that, that you hope that they will see. Um, the other thing is to remember that test optional does not mean test blind. So even the UCs if you and Cal States, if you take the test, and there will be ample time in the fall to take these tests, even over the summer, there's going to be sittings for the test. Um, so if you, submit those scores, they will be reviewed as part of your admission um, admission packet. So I just really encourage students to think about it from a strategic standpoint before they make that decision to say goodbye to the standardized testing altogether. Um, one last point is that if parents or and students go to fairtest.org, uh, fairtest.org, that is the housing, you know, that's the website that, that houses all of the universities across the country that are test optional. Mm -hmm. And that can be a very good resource. Great, great to know. Thank you. Yeah. If you're just joining us, I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers, and my guest today is Janice Royal, certified college counselor and founder of Royal College Consulting. I wanna check in one more time before we wrap up uh, with Lauren to see if there are questions that our uh, families have about college. We do, we wanna catch up here. Um, this is a great topic and I think it resonates a lot with our families and parents, especially right now with this time of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine asks um, about community college, and I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. I'll take it down after um, we address this. But um, just going from being in a community college to university, 
um, her son has had accommodations and he hasn't needed to use them. And so, um, you know, he's not taking advantage of them. Oh, let's hide this. Oh, wait. Um, he's not taking advantage of them. And so, you know, the parents always ask, well, do I, you know, mom is encouraging him to pursue it at the university level. And parents always ask, like, should we do that? I mean, it's better, right, to have something in place than to not. It's a little bit different K-12 when parents ask us. I mean, of course, when we're, we're working with learning and attention challenges, our goal is for for kids not to need services at the K-12 level. And so at an IEP level, when, when um, students start to need fewer and fewer accommodations and, and modifications, we think that's a great thing. But how is that different at the university level? It's a huge difference. And I would absolutely agree with you, Lauren, that it is, in, in my opinion, in my what I recommend to my families, it's critical that the student go ahead and put get the disabilities, get the accommodations in place. So there's a process. Once the student has um, accepted an offer of admission and sent in their their deposit, then I incur. Then they need to register or a, not apply to like you would a university, but register with the disability services office. Mm -hmm. And that is a particular process that most universities you can look on their website and it tells you exactly what the steps are. But again, that's where you would then submit the documentation and an intake session would be scheduled between the disability services director on most often and the student. Sometimes the parent um, can participate, but definitely the, the student and the disability services director. And then based on the documentation um, that says what accommodations are available, I encourage the student, ask for everything, mm -hmm. right? Ask mm -hmm. for the moon. And if you only need one or two things as you progress through your university experience, then awesome. And, you know, we can celebrate that. That's, that's wonderful growth. However, it takes time to get accommodations in place. And once the semester has started, you cannot go back and say, oh, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. uncle, I give. This is really much harder than I thought. Now I need my accommodations. It doesn't work like that. You have to have your accommodations in place before the beginning of every semester. And in college, semesters, quarters, those are all brand new chunks of time, brand new chunks of tuition, brand new opportunities. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so the, um, the accommodations follow that. Um, I have a visual here that I'd like to share with Catherine and with the audience that I think illustrates why it's so important for students to pursue getting their accommodations in place as they begin their collegiate career. Um, if you think about back in the day, if you did happen to attend college, it, it can be a bit of a rude awakening as to how much harder all of your classes are. And if you add on top of that, that you might be moving away from, a student might be moving out of their family home for the first time, it'll be the first time that they've not had structured time. There's no one telling them when to get up, when to go to bed, when to go to class. You don't even, uh, parents, forgive me for saying this uh, on a recording, but you don't have to go to class. But if you don't, you're going to miss a ginormous amounts of information and fall so quickly behind. But do students all know that? Well, my students do because I take them through a transition meeting. Um, but the enormity of the changes between high school and college are huge for, again, every, every student. Um, so that visual is my challenge to students. Do you want to take those stairs and, you know, risk having a <laughs> panic attack and getting out of breath when you're halfway through and realizing you are in a world of hurt? Um, that's what college is going to maybe like without accommodations. 
wouldn't it be much easier to go up the escalator and still reach your destination? You're not jumping ahead of in line. You're not there. It's not a cheating. It's not a, it's, Nobody knows that you have accommodations except for you and the disability service office and the professor and whoever you share it with. And you know what? In college, nobody cares. Um, so take the escalator and reach your destination and be prepared. Get yourself your, edu you know, get your education um, without any bumps in the road whether it be your mental health or your physical health, because you're so stressed out, because you're taking those stairs every single day, every single uh, semester. I vote go the escalator <laughs> route. <Okay. laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and Lauren is right. I mean, at, at Stowell Learning Centers, we're really looking to correct, develop the underlying skills that are getting in the way of the student learning as comfortably and efficiently as they can and, and really correct those learning challenges, level the playing field. Yes. But at the same time, that is really good advice. I mean, even if you are doing fabulous, which we, you know, is certainly our goal, let's, let's get the supports in place because I didn't realize you can't just do that any time. It has to be in place at the beginning of the semester or the trimester. Wow, that's that is um, really valuable to know. And I, I also would say, hey, err on the side of caution. Get everything in place, and then if you don't need it, that's celebrate. You know, exactly. You've got, you've got exactly. whatever you need to have a really good experience in college. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have we have another question from Anne, and she's asking specific, specifically about community college versus going right into a four year university. Do you have an opinion on that, Janice? Um, do you suggest usually that students with learning and attention challenges do the community college route and then transfer into a university? Does it make the process easier or go right into a four year university? Well, for anyone that has ever participated in any kind of uh, college event, webinar, campus tour, any kind of conversation, our standard answer is it depends. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it truly does depend. It depends on so many variables. It depends on the students, uh, what are their grades? What kind of grades do they have? What kind of courses have they taken in high school? If they are not prepared academically to move to a four-year institution, I think community college can be a tremendously excellent choice and a great place to start so that they can uh, almost not a do-over because they'll be taking college-level courses, but when students are older and they realize, okay, perhaps I didn't get to where I should have, um, where I needed to be in high school, now I can start fresh in community college and I can use my accommodations, I can seek out tutors, I can go to the math tutoring center, I can go to the writing center, all those things, and get all A's or A's and B's, but mostly A's, right? And and sort of get a much better presentation of yourself as you want to then move into, uh, go to a four-year university so you can get your bachelor's. So that might be one reason. Financial is a tremendously important reason. Four-year universities are a very, very expensive. Um, if a student, especially if a student lives on campus, that can add, 15, 16, $18,000. Um, even if you go to a, a Cal State, San Diego State uh, might be $7,000 in tuition, but it's another 17, close to 18 to do room and board. So, so financial reasons are, you know, may impact a family's decision to start a community college. Is it easier? Oh, the other reason is that a student may not be 
emotionally ready, again, mm-hmm. for our kiddos with learning differences. They have, they continually have to overcome so many challenges every day. It may not be the right time um, in their mature, in their maturity and their maturation to, to move away from home and go to a four year university. So that's when a community college can be an outstanding choice. Then um, is the process easier to then transfer to a four-year university? Not really, (laughs) because uh, it's essentially the same process as when they were in high school without perhaps the standardized testing element. That piece of the pie tends to go away after a student has so many units under their belt. Hmm. Again, it depends. It depends if the student in California, our community colleges work hand in glove with our Cal States and our UCs. So Hmm. there are literally transfer agreements and guaranteed, you know, transfer agreement guarantees where students are, if they take the appropriate classes and do the prerequisites and earn a particular GPA, they can much more simply and much easier than transition or or transfer to a UC campus or a Cal State. Mm -hmm. If they want to go to a four-year university, a private university, um, or a university out of state, those universities all have separate, different, unique transfer processes. And their processes, you can, you know, you can find on their websites and it's going to be similar in many ways, letters of recommendation, essays, the application, the application fee, all those kinds of things um, to, to make, you know, to apply. The timing is also varies. Some universities only accept fall applicants for transfer. Some universities will also accept spring applicants. So depending on the student's needs uh, as to when they want to make this change or they're ready to make the change with their current um, courses, then that timing can be important as well. And the process for developing that college list is the same for when they if they were to have done it in high school. What are the accommodations that are available at that particular university? Where do you wanna go geographically? Do they have your major? All those things that I mentioned earlier in the program. Well, thank you so much, Janice. This is tremendous information. And remember, Janice has some great handouts for you, which you can get by going to stowellcenter.com slash college. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell from Stowell Learning Centers. College planning can be overwhelming. As I was listening to you, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm glad my kids have already gone through it. Um, But your job, Janice, is to make it not overwhelming. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Well, I have several ways to get a hold of me. Uh, Probably the simplest is to email me at Janice. uh, My email address, pardon me, is Janice at RoyalCollegeConsulting.com. So pretty easy to remember. Uh, You can also phone me. I'm frequently in meetings like this, either with my students or listening to webinars, learning about COVID-19 responses. Um, So you can text me always at my phone. I also have a website that is up there and you can reach out to me via the website. There's a contact page there. And then I am also can be direct messaged through Facebook and Instagram. And I do encourage anyone listening to please follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I am I am a frequent poster. I put information up at least twice a day, nearly every day. And it's important to get, you know, it's a good way, good resource for parents um, to see all the latest and greatest with college planning. 
Definitely. I mean, it's a it's a good resource anytime and especially now because I know so many people have questions. Thank you so much, Janice. It You're has welcome. been wonderful to have you. This Thank is LB you. Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stoll, and uh, we are live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Next Tuesday, Dr. Giancarlo Lacata is going to be talking to us about sleep, something that can either be a superpower or a saboteur. This is fascinating stuff, and it impacts your child's learning and your ability to help them. So you do not want to miss it. Be sure and join us uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific next Tuesday. Stowell Learning Centers are open. We are doing remote screenings, remote set sessions. We are starting new students from all around the world. If you would like to speak with someone about your child, give us a call at 877-774-0444 or visit us online at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Janice, and everyone who joined us today, and all of you who have been sharing our broadcast. You are awesome. We have over 17,000 views so far, so thank you for that. Hey, everybody needs a little support right now, so have a great day, and please pass this along to other parents who might need it.